come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. Welcome to Mount Carmel Baptist Church. We're glad to have you out here with us this morning, and I hope that you are glad to be here. I am. I hope that you are too. If you're not excited, I hope you get excited before this service is over. I hope you have a good service with the Lord this morning, and we do so together. Now, let me tell you the reason we're here, and the reason we're here is because of Jesus Christ and what He means to us and what He's done for us. We're here to celebrate Him, and so we want to do that together today. And we're going to do that a lot of ways, preaching and singing and praying and taking up an offer and having an invitation, a lot of different parts to our service. Ultimately, we want all those things to point you to the Lord this morning, all right? So if you would, too, if you would do me a favor, if you are a guest, be your first time or your first time in a real long time, in the pew in front of you, there should be a card there. If you would, fill that welcome card out. You can drop that in the offering plate or you can drop that at the Welcome Center on your way out this morning. I appreciate you doing that. And uh, we also going to have some uh, our, our plate offering plates are at the back this morning for you. And, and Carolyn's going to talk to you in a little bit about uh, offering envelopes. Is that right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, we're going to have those available to you at the back as well for our Lottie Moon Christmas offering, I think, is what we're going to be talking about. So uh, several things happening here this morning. Uh, one of the things that's happening is Jesus is here. And he has promised us that. And so we are glad to be here with you together here today. Uh, be in prayer for Dad. He's preaching this morning in Armona. And so be in prayer for him. Mom decided to come hear some good preaching. Dad's over there at Armona and Mom's here with us. <laughs> but uh, we're glad to have you with us today too. And we're glad to celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ together don't forget, Tuesday at 7 o'clock, we're going to have a worship service here at Mount Carmel. Normally at Thanksgiving, we have a joint worship service with several churches in our area. But uh, just because of uh, COVID and because of the different rules that each church may have in place, you know, different rules for masks and distancing and that sort of thing, and especially now, I get that we made this decision a while back to not have that joint service and to have those services individually. And with the spread that's going on, it seems like maybe that's probably a good decision. Uh, so be in prayer for our service Tuesday. Come back Tuesday evening, 7 o'clock, and we're going to have a good Thanksgiving service. We're going to take time to, to remember to thank the Lord for the good things He has done for us. So how many of you can honestly say the Lord has done some good things for you this morning? Say amen. amen. Well, we're going to celebrate that Tuesday night, so come back and be a part of that also. Thank you for being here today. Lord bless you and keep you. Elijah, wait, we, that's the, at the end of the service. I'll say that. Elijah, you come and uh, lead us in some singing. How about that? All right. Uh, birthdays and anniversaries. Uh, <laughs> he keeps forgetting, so I'll just keep doing it. Any birthdays or anniversaries? Uh oh. Is this a birthday? <laughs> All right, we're going to be on our Baptist hymns this morning. We're going to be on number 334, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. His spirit washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. 
praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, ring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest, I am my Savior. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. All right, we're going to turn over to number 33 now, and if everybody can and will, please stand.
oftentimes I feel like I'm not really uh, worthy to sing up here uh, to take this position uh, because I'm not as good at singing as some people. Uh, but uh, uh, a lot of times after that thought, I'm reminded that <clears throat> I'm not called to be a perfect singer. I'm not called to be the perfect song leader. I'm called to serve. in song. If you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24, and we're going to begin in verse 13. <clears throat> we're going to look today at the, the road to Emmaus. We've been, over the last few weeks, we've had a sermon series going called On the Road Again, and we looked at several instances of Scripture where the Bible tells us about roads of travel, that God led people down physically but what we found is with each of these physical roads that they traveled, that there was a spiritual lesson that we learned. And so we, we read about the wilderness way in Exodus 13 and how God specifically took them the long way around, away from the Philistines, so that their heart wouldn't grow faint. Now God sometimes leads us the long way around because He knows what's best for us. We studied last week about the road to Damascus. And there, Saul encounters Jesus Christ and has that salvation experience where his eyes were opened 
He, he, was, he who was once an enemy of Jesus has now become his friend and follower. That today is something similar to the road to Damascus, but not quite the same spiritual emphasis. It is people coming to the realization of Jesus Christ, but this is the road to Emmaus. And so listen to what the Bible says here in verse 13 of these two disciples who knew of Jesus, had followed Jesus, but didn't quite understand the real Jesus. Verse 13 of Luke 24 says this, Behold, two of them went the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened, and it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus Himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know Him. And He said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one wit to another as ye walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, saying unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been He which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they had found not His body, they came, saying that they had seen a vision of angels, which said that He was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher, and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Would y'all pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for today and all of the blessings that you give to us. And they are many. Too many for us to even count. Too many for us to even know about. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you give us. We thank you that we can gather here today freely to worship Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And Father, I pray that you bless this time together today as we do so. Sanctify it. Use it for your honor and your glory. Lord, we pray this morning for our nation. We pray for Blunt County. We pray for safety. We pray for peace. We pray for strength and comfort. Lord, this morning I pray that the name of Jesus would be magnified in churches all across Blount County. That the name of Jesus would go forth and that people could be saved and give their heart to Jesus Christ. Thank you for all the things you have done for us. Thank you for all the things you are going to do for us. But above all things, thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Johannes Gutenberg was a German inventor, and you may know that name. He invented the printing press about 1440 A.D., invented the printing press. The key was that he had a, a mold, these new molding techniques, which allowed him to invent movable type. Now, he wasn't the first to ever come up with movable type. The Chinese and Koreans had done, done something similar, but... The difference was, it was a movable type that was made from metal, and he was the first to mechanize that process. He transferred the ink from the movable type to the paper, and he was the first one that was able to mechanize that process so it could be repeated over and over. He used ink from linseed oil and soot, just in case you're wondering. Took, took some of his ashes from his chimney and, and made ink from it. When he invented this printing press the amount of knowledge uh, greatly expanded across the world. Yep. All right, so this, I, I have this introduction, and I, I, but I hope you understand the significance of that event. 
Y'all know what the first thing he printed was whenever he, whenever he invented a printing press? You know what the first thing he printed? He printed the Bible. The Gutenberg Bible. That's why he invented the printing press. It's so people could read the Bible. You ever heard of the Dark Ages? Anybody ever heard of the Dark Ages? You know, when the plague killed everybody and, and, and everybody thought that spirits were in, were in a sneeze and so every time you sneezed, people would say, bless you because they thought you were releasing some evil spirits or something. You know, stuff like that. And, and people did not know the Word of God and they were scared of life. And a guy invented the printing press and printed the Bible so, pick it up, so people could pick it up and read it. And it brought them out of the dark ages, the Word of God. And we live in a pretty dark time today, too, in a lot of ways. There's a lot of unknown, and there's a lot of ignorance. As a matter of fact, we're facing a disease that they really don't know that much about right now. And I'm going to tell you the one thing that will help you and me and this world more than anything else. It is still the Word of God. Still. The first thing he did was he in, it printed a Bible and, and it, it enlightened the world. Now he invented a printing press. He didn't invent the Bible. He invented the the printing press printed the first Bible so that people could know facts and truth. Now, some people over the years have invented stories so that the truth might be obscured and not be covered up. They've invented stories. He just invented a printing press so people could hear the Bible. Facts and truth. And uh, we live in a day where people, even though there are a lot of things written down for you to read, there are things that you can see and you can hear, people really don't know what to believe anymore. And in a world where nobody knows what they can trust and what they cannot, let me assure you, you can believe, read, and trust the Word of God. You can take the Bible, read it, believe it. It can be a rock in your life when everything around you is sinking sand. And here are these disciples of Jesus and their life really is sort of sinking sand at this point they, they're, everything is in chaos everything is confusion for them they don't know what to do they don't know what to believe they, verse 13 starts off and says this behold two of them went the same day now if you learned anything as, as we've learned how to study your Bible one of the things that you learn is when you read something like the same day you got to go figure out what that's talking about. Well, verse 1 says this, Now upon the first day of the week. Well, that's the same day. The first day. The same day. The first day. The Lord's day. Sunday. Resurrection day. This is the day Jesus rose from the dead. That's the day we're talking about. That same day. The first day of the week. And verse 13 says that, that, Behold, two of them went the same day to a village called Emmaus, which is from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs, about seven miles. Seven miles to walk. Didn't have cars back then. I guess they could have taken a donkey or a camel or something like that, but uh, seven miles to walk for these two. Seven miles to contemplate. And seven miles to discuss, seven miles to consider, seven miles to figure out who Jesus really is. And that's what they're doing. They're walking, and they're talking, and they're trying to figure out who Jesus is. Verse 14 says, they talk together of all these things which had happened. This is talking about the arrest and the trial. They would have been there for the triumphal entry of Jesus as people laid coats and palm branches down and hailed Him as the, uh, the Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. They were there for that. They would have seen that uh, arrest of Jesus Christ. They would have seen the mock trial of Jesus. They were there to witness the beating of Jesus. They would have 
watched, watched and walked at the distance as he carried his cross up Golgotha, up Calvary's hill. And there he was nailed to the cross. There he suffered, he bled, and he died. They had seen all of that. Maybe they were even there for the burial process, which was hurried. It was a Sabbath day, so they had to quickly do this before sunset. And so they wrap his body quickly, don't even have time to do the proper uh, burial process. They didn't embalm in those days, at least in Israel. And so what they would do is they would wrap, cover the body in spices and then wrap it in some linen wrappings to sort of cover the smell of decay. But they didn't have time to do that for Jesus. So seven miles to think about those things, to ponder what they had seen, to think about who Jesus was. And as they thought about Jesus and who He was, a remarkable thing happened. Jesus drew near to them. Now, might I suggest to you this morning that if you take the time to consider Jesus, to ponder Him, to investigate who He really is, that as you do so, Jesus will draw near to you every single time. He drew near to them. Verse 15, it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus Himself drew near. Now that word drew near is a word here. It indicates that He quickened His pace to catch up to them. He purposefully caught up to them. This wasn't Jesus just accidentally bumping into these two men by happenstance as they discussed all that had happened to Him. Jesus drew near to them purposefully. It was something that He intentionally did. And uh, as you look to who Jesus is, I can promise you He will draw near to you too. And it is purposeful, not by accident. Jesus drew near to them. Do you remember a time when Jesus drew near to you? We don't have seven miles this morning. But maybe we do have seven minutes. Maybe we can all take time this morning to reflect back on who Jesus was, who Jesus is, what Jesus is going to do. And maybe as we reflect on Jesus, one of the things we can do is take time just to remember the times that Jesus has drawn near to us. The times He's done so to you individually. Maybe you're a believer. You've been saved. And you can look back and think back on that time that you gave your heart to Jesus and He drew near to you. Maybe it was during a difficult time in your life because you had suffered the death of a loved one or faced the loss of a job. Maybe a marriage had dissolved. Maybe you had gone through a health situation, a health crisis yourself. And, and at that time, Jesus drew near to you in a very particular way. Maybe it was during a great revival meeting you attended when the Spirit of God moved in a great way and the Lord set your soul on fire afresh and anew and you remember Jesus drawing near to you in that way. Uh, maybe it's dur during the times of celebration of your life, whenever you had the birth of a child or, or you moved to a, a new job or a new place. Well, maybe it was during those celebratory times and Jesus drew near to you as you contemplate who Jesus is. Do you remember some times that He has taken time to draw near to you? He drew near to these men. And verse 16 says, But their eyes were holding that they should not know Him. Their eyes were holding. That means restrained. This indicates a purposeful act by God Himself. It wasn't that they just didn't recognize Him because they hadn't seen Him for a while. This seems to be a supernatural act where God purposefully restrained their eyesight so that they could not recognize Him physically. Now everybody listen real close because this is the, the, the crux of this event. They did not recognize, them, recognize Him physically because God wanted them to recognize Him spiritually. It doesn't matter much if they had recognized Him physically, but they still didn't know the point of His existence. They didn't know the purpose of His coming. People recognize Jesus physically today often. 
They see Jesus represented in a church or a steeple. Maybe they hear the song Amazing Grace and they know that's a spiritual song and they recognize that physically that's a representation of Jesus Christ. Maybe it's the Lord's Supper that a church observes or a baptism that they have witnessed over the years and they see these pictures and symbols and representations of Jesus physically, but they don't comprehend the spiritual significance of that. They see someone baptized, they know there's a religious significance to that, but they don't understand that Jesus died for their sins, rose again from the dead, and that you and I can receive Him, we can be dead to the old person we used to be, and alive, resurrected a new person now in Jesus Christ. They don't understand that this... Uh, communion that we observe sometimes is a physical act, a representation of the act that Jesus did Himself. He shed His blood. He gave His body so that you and I might be saved. We see these things physically, but a lot of people fail to recognize Jesus spiritually. And Jesus asked them, verse 17, He said to them, What manner of communications are these that you have one with another as you walk and are sad. So these men are walking and talking, and Jesus hears them, and He asks them what He's talking about. But He takes time to recognize one other thing, too. He says, and you're sad. They, they weren't just speaking about the events. They were mourning the events of, that had occurred. Their hearts were broken. And Jesus wants them to talk about what they had seen and why they were sad about what they had seen. Now you contrast this to what Paul says about it later. We we looked last week at the road to Damascus and how Saul had this conversion experience with Jesus Christ. Later he becomes the Apostle Paul. In Galatians chapter 6, 14, Paul says, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of Jesus Christ, by which I am crucified to the world and the world to me. Paul, after he had this encounter with Jesus Christ, the risen Jesus, and his eyes were opened, the scales fell off, he was no longer blind, and he recognized Jesus for who he was. After that occurred, he said that he gloried in the cross. It didn't sadden him, it didn't depress him, it didn't worry him. He gloried in the cross of Jesus Christ. Here these men are, and they see the exact same event, and they're sad. What's the difference? Why are these two different reactions? Well, there's this realization that Jesus is dead. Right? That's the realization they've come to so far. Now, that's all they've come to, but that's the realization they have come to. Jesus is dead, and they're saddened. They say this, verse 18, one of them, who, one of them whose name was... Cleopas, let me stop and say this. We don't know anything about Cleopas else other than this. I don't know why Luke included his name, but he is listed in the Bible, Cleopas. It's the only time you're going to see much about Cleopas. But here's what Cleopas says. The one time he gets his name in Scripture, here's what he says. Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast thou not known the things which are come to pass in these days? Are you the only person in Jerusalem... You're a foreigner in Jerusalem and you're the only one who hadn't heard what happened? So let me ask you this. I'll give you an example. Any, raise your hand if you would. Just, just I, I know you're asleep. Wake up just a second here. Raise your hand. Anybody in here heard anything recently, ever recently about coronavirus? Raise your hand if you've heard about coronavirus. Now imagine, imagine if you're walking and talking. Me and Larry Stargell are walking along here and talking about coronavirus. And Tracy Strickland comes up and says, what are y'all talking about? And Larry says, "Uh, we're talking about coronavirus. And Tracy says, what's coronavirus? Can you imagine somebody, (laughs) well, maybe Tracy, but uh, anybody else, can can you imagine somebody who hadn't heard about coronavirus? What if you're walking along talking, and me and Curtis are walking along talking, And somebody says, what are you talking about? Curtis says, we're talking about the election. Who won the president? And they said, what do you mean election? Who's Trump? Who's Biden? What election? 
Can you imagine the astonishment that would fall on people if somebody had the audacity to say, what election? I didn't know there was an election. What coronavirus? I hadn't heard about a coronavirus. Well, Jesus says, what events? Oh, by the way, just, just so you know, Jesus had, was aware of what had happened. You know that, right? <laughs> he, he was there. He saw it. He experienced it. He knew it. He is not asking this question for His benefit. He's asking this question for their benefit. That takes us all the way back to Genesis. To the very first part of the Bible. Adam and Eve are hiding. And God says, Adam, where are you? Now God knew where Adam was. But God wanted Adam to know where Adam was. Sin had entered this world and sin had entered Adam. And for the first time in his life, Adam was hiding from God. And now... Jesus asks him this question, what events? Not because he doesn't know, but because they don't know. They saw it, and they still don't know what's happened. Verse 19, he said unto them, what things? They said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. So good, they're off to the right start. He's a prophet, mighty in word and deed, but so much more than a prophet. You know that, don't you? Jesus is so much more than a prophet. And they claim that a prophet, mighty in word and deed. Verse 20, And now the chief priests and rulers delivered Him to be condemned to death and have crucified Him, but we trusted that it had been He which should have redeemed Israel. We thought He would redeem Israel. So here's the choice you and I face. We can have the God of our own choosing, or you can take the Bible, all of it, and what it reveals to us about God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you can trust it and believe it. But there are an awful lot of folks who would rather invent their own God and their own religion and their own beliefs, instead of accept what the Bible has to say about God Himself. The Bible did say that Jesus would come and rule and reign. We, we read those verses at Christmas time. He shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, and the government shall rest upon His shoulders, and of His rule there shall be no end. And we read about those verses, of how He's going to come and, and rule and reign and take away all our problems. Wouldn't it be nice if that somebody could snap their fingers and come along and take away coronavirus? And you never wouldn't it be nice if you never had to wear a mask again in your life? <laughs> wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if whoever the next time around is, the next time a guy wins the president, if he could snap his fingers and fix all our problems and take everything away. Wouldn't that be nice? But you and I have lived long enough to know that that doesn't happen from medicine and it doesn't happen from man. Certainly some politicians are better than others. There's no, there's no doubt about that. But none of them can fix all of our problems. Doc, Dr. Fauci cannot solve all of the world's ills and evils. There is only one who can solve all the world's ills and all the world's evils, but you have to receive Him as He is. Not as you want Him to be. You see, they expected Jesus to come and rule and reign, and, and He was going to kick out the Roman army, and He was going to make Israel a national power. That's what they thought. He would be a political, military leader and overthrow the Roman army and make Israel 
the height of, of power across the world again. And Jesus will do that one day. You understand me? You hear me? There is coming a day where Jesus Christ Himself will return and He will rule and He will reign. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. It's at the name of Jesus that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But before He could ever come as the ruling, reigning King, He first came as the suffering servant to take away the sins of the world. And they liked the part of the Bible about Him ruling and reigning, but they didn't hear the part about suffering. And that's all of us are that way, aren't we? We all like the parts of the Bible that give the great grand promises of God, but sometimes we don't want to hear the part about where we need to submit to Jesus Christ. We have to confess that we are sinful people. We have to repent of the wrong that we have done. We have to uh, be willing to accept God's will instead of trying to impose our will on God. We have to be willing to do things His way instead of trying to get Him to do things our way. And we don't like those parts of the Bible. We want to reject those parts and turn away from that. There, There is this realization that Jesus has died. And then there's this revelation. Why? They say certain women came and said that they went to the tomb, the tomb's empty, angels told us that He's alive. Some of the disciples, they don't don't name them disciples, they say some of the men with us ran and saw the empty tomb, but Jesus wasn't there. Verse 25, Then He said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into His glory. He says, if you'd read the Bible, you should have known that this was going to happen. You should have known. And then in verse 27, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, He expounded unto them and all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. The Bible has always pointed to the fact that Jesus would suffer and die. Adam and Eve sinned. They are hiding from God. God slew an animal to cover their sins. He covered them physically with an animal skin, but it is a picture, a symbol, a representation of what it took to cover their sinfulness. It took the shed blood of an animal to cover the sinfulness of Adam and Eve. Abraham raised a knife to slay his son as a sacrifice to God, and God stopped him and offered a ram of sacrifice in its place. If that isn't a perfect picture of Jesus Christ, I don't know what He is. God delivered the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. The last plague was the death of the firstborn of everything in Egypt. But if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to avoid the death angel, if you wanted the death angel to pass over your house, you slaughtered a lamb and you took the blood of that lamb and you put it on the doorposts of your house. And if the blood of the lamb covered your house, death passed you by. I don't think there's a better picture of Jesus anywhere else in the Bible than that. But there are more. Every time a priest offered sins for the people of Israel in the tabernacle and later to the temple under the law of God, he would take a goat and he would sprinkle the blood of that goat on the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant there, and that would pay for the sins of Israel for a year. Every time that you see sin, you see the shed blood of an animal that pictures the shed blood of something else, someone else, someone greater, who is going to come and save us from our sins. Isaiah says, In Isaiah 53, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And by His stripes we are healed. They should have known. The revelation was there. But not the recognition. They didn't recognize Jesus physically because they didn't recognize Him spiritually. So Jesus shows them in Scripture what it says. Verse 28, They drew nigh unto the village, whither they went. He made as though He would have gone further, but they constrained Him, abide, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And He went in uh, to tarry with them, and it came to pass, as He sat at meat with them, they, uh, having a meal, as He sat at meat with them, He took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave to them And their eyes were opened, and they knew Him, and He vanished out of their sight. When? When He broke the bread. 
You remember that happening any other time in Scripture where Jesus broke bread and gave it to others? Happened just before His death there in the upper room when He's with His disciples. He breaks that bread and says, This is my body broken for you. This eat in remembrance of me. He did the same thing with the cup, the Bible tells us. That was the first institution of the Lord's Supper, communion. Now this passage starts with communion. It even uses that word in the King James says that they had communed together in verse 15. It came to pass that while they communed together, that it starts off with communion, but it ends with a different kind of communion, not a conversation, but this visible reminder, this visible picture of who Jesus is and why Jesus came. Jesus came to die. When you and I die, at least we will. Hopefully you make it through the service. We, you know, we're going to go and be with the Lord one day. If you're saved, we will die. But Jesus did not have to. He came to die for you and for me. He left a splendor in the glory of heaven where He was worshipped, served, and adored. Came to this earth, born a virgin birth. He lived a sinless life. And then He died on the cross in your place and in my place. He took upon Himself your sins and my sins. On the third day, He rose from the dead, victorious over sin, death, hell, and the grave. And these men did not recognize all that they had seen. They had seen the death of Jesus. They knew there was an empty tomb. But they did not understand why Jesus came and who Jesus was. At least not until He broke that bread. And then they recognize Him physically, but not just physically, they recognize Him spiritually. Verse 33, And they rose up the same hour, returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered together them with Him, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how He was known to them in the breaking of bread. They recognized Jesus for who He was. Verse 32 says that, And they said one to another, Did our heart not burn within us? Did our heart not burn within us while He talked with us by the way, and while He opened to us the Scriptures. Does your heart burn for Jesus Christ? Do you know Him? Do you love Him? Will you serve Him? Do you recognize Jesus for who He is and what He has done for you? He has taken away your sins so that you might live. Do you know Him? Do you love Him? Will you serve Him? I'm going to ask our instrumentalists to come and we're going to have a hymn of invitation. I don't know what the Lord may be dealing with you about here this morning. Maybe you're here and you need to be saved. Maybe you're watching this online. Maybe you don't know Jesus and you'd like to. I'm going to pray a prayer this morning and if you want to be saved, you want to have your sins forgiven. You want to have new eternal life. You can. I'm going to pray a prayer out loud. I want you to pray this prayer with me. If you mean this prayer, if you're sincere in this prayer, Jesus will save you. He'll forgive you of your sins. You will have new eternal spiritual life. The prayer goes like this. Jesus, I know I have sinned. I believe you died for my sins. I want you to forgive me of my sins. I want you to save me. I repent of my sins. I turn from them. And I turn to you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Now help me to live for you. Amen prayed that prayer will you talk with me will you let me know you can call me call our office here send me a text or email or something let me know about that decision you made if there's a decision that you want to make maybe a different decision you have been saved but you haven't been living for the lord and you want to come this morning and repent of your sins and rededicate your life to jesus and leave here afresh and anew today on fire for jesus maybe some other decision maybe you want to join our church maybe you want to be baptized you've been saved and you want to follow the lord 
in obedience in baptism or maybe something else. Whatever decision you need to make, we're going to have an invitation. If the Lord is speaking to your heart, you step out right now and come. Would you stand with me?